Christian Parenting. Today we're going to celebrate episode 200 of Let's Parent on Purpose, and I'm going to share with you what I believe is the most important message that I can get across to every single mom and dad. Hey, my name is Jay Holland, and this is Let's Parent on Purpose. It's a podcast to help you thrive and not just survive your parenting years. Each week, I'll bring you an insight or an interview that will help strengthen your marriage, your family, or your personal walk with Jesus. And if you find it helpful, I encourage you to subscribe, share it with your friends, and you're welcome to go to letsparentonpurpose.com to find all kinds of past articles, issues, and resources to help your family. In 2016, I really found myself wrestling through a dilemma. Um, I felt like as a youth pastor at Covenant Fellowship Baptist Church that there was a lot of really high quality ministry happening each week, but I, I felt this burden that I was not connecting with moms and dads, and I fully believe that the greatest ministry impact is not what happens in a youth group, but what happens in a household. My problem was that um, most of my ministry hours, you know, on Sunday morning or on Wednesday morning, I was either in the main worship service or I was with teenagers. And so I, I couldn't figure out how to connect and pour into moms and dads like I really wanted to. Um, so I started doing some feedback with moms and dads. And ultimately out of that was birthed this idea of what if we do a weekly podcast where um, I will try to enrich parents, give them some different resources and insights. And uh, in that way, no matter where they are or what's going on in their week, they'll be able to uh, continue to grow as moms and dads in their encouragement, in their, um, in their confidence in being able to disciple their kids. And I was really impacted because I remember reading a study that says that the average teen uh, is in church maybe 50 hours a year, but that they get about 3,000 hours a year with their parents. And so um, obviously what happens in the home is going to far outstrip what happens in those few hours that we're together. And as I kind of measured just the average teen that we were getting, I felt like, hey, maybe we're an advanced church and we get 100 hours a year with the average kid, but that's still so far below 3000. And so out of that, out of some praying and some feedback with moms and dads, we began Let's Parent on Purpose. And so I think it launched actually right around the beginning of 2017. And now we are all the way to episode 200. And so just want to take a minute to celebrate and praise the Lord. And I'm going to use this fancy button that I have on my recording device. Aren't you glad that I don't do that on a regular basis? Uh, it would be super annoying. But I, it really is a, a celebration today. And as I was thinking about what to do with this episode, there's a message that I think, more important than bringing on a special interview, I think there's a message that God has laid on my heart that is the most important message that I could give to moms and dads. And before I jump into that, I just felt like I have um, just this heart that wants to say thank you to Jesus um, for a few different groups of people. The first people that I'm thankful to Jesus for um, are my wife and children, uh, and even my mom and dad, because they have given me endless topics and material to, to wrestle through here. So oftentimes what I cover on Let's Parent on Purpose is just something that we are wrestling through, or we have wrestled through, or I feel stuck on an issue, and I need to explore it and find somebody that will help me so thank you to Emily and the kids. I'm glad you're okay with being an illustration. Or in my kids' case, they don't even know that they are. I'm deeply thankful to Jesus for my church, Covenant Fellowship Baptist Church, um, not only for giving the green light to this, but putting basically all of the initial funding uh, to get Let's Parent on Purpose launched. And one of the things that happened was after, you know, about a half a year of this podcast, we started realizing the very same things that moms and dads in Stewart, Florida needed were exactly what parents all around the country and really all around the world needed. And so we began to put the structure in place to 
um, make Let's Parent on Purpose available to anybody wherever they were. And as that happened and the podcast began to grow, um, that raises my, my third group of people I'm just so thankful for. And that's my Patreon supporters and also those who've given one-time gifts. It cost a whole lot more to make something available to everybody than it does just to make it available to those in our church. There's a lot of website stuff. There's hosting things to be able to stream it all around the world and have it work available. There's some quality issues that have to be taken care of. And I have just been so incredibly blessed by some of you who are so faithful in generously giving to cover the cost of that, to make it easy for me to make changes, to do remote interviews, to upgrade equipment. And so I just am deeply thankful before the Lord. Um, I'm not trying to make a ton of money off this thing, and and uh, I'm, I'm not even trying to make a living off of Less Parent on Purpose, but it is really a blessing that it doesn't cost me money to produce this podcast every week. And uh, you guys make it possible, and you make it possible whatever it is that the Lord has. It just feels like you guys have stepped in, God's put it on your heart, and have provided. So thank you for that. Because of you guys, uh, the Christian Parenting Podcast Network found us and picked us up. So um, just so you know, I don't get paid from the Christian Parenting Podcast Network, but it's an incredible partnership where they now produce this show and and they do a f- super job at it. I think you know, if you've been around a while, the audio production is radically better. And so even those of you guys who are editing it right now, thank you. You do an awesome job. They also promoted at christianparenting.org, which has tons of great material on there. I'd encourage you to go check that out. And then finally, the the last group I am so incredibly thankful for is you. You the listener. You know, without you, this actually doesn't matter. It doesn't happen. So you have been listening, you've been sharing it. As a matter of fact, I don't I don't know that I've spent more than $100 total in four years in promoting this show. Uh, It's all been because you share it with people that you think would benefit. You've left reviews on iTunes, and I really appreciate you continuing to do that. You give me feedback. I get emails basically every single week from a listener that tells me what their family situation's like, how Let's Parent on Purpose is helping them. And they are from around the world, from Australia, from Japan, from the Middle East, um, from Asia, uh, as well as all around the United States and North America. So that's been incredibly, incredibly encouraging. And then lastly, you you keep coming back, um, and that just is a blessing. And, uh, and I think it's important for me to continue to invest in my own parenting. You know, I have four kids at four different stages, and I have to admit that every moment of every day, I am still in a new spot when it comes to parenting. I have never had a parenting situation exactly like I have right now. And I need the investment of the word of God and of wise people into my ears and into my heart and life um, so that we can try to thrive as a family. So as a thank you for those of you who are listening, uh, what I want to do is in my things for Thursday email that many of you get, uh, this week I'm going to send out just kind of a mega bundle of basically everything that I've produced that I think would help you. I'm going to put it in a Dropbox folder. So that's Fun Family Conversations ebook. It's a marriage snapshot tool. It's a parenting vision tool or a marriage visioning tool. There's a scripture memory tool. I've got a bunch of contracts, like if your kids are going to start with a cell phone or you know screen time contracts. There's just so many things. Anything that I can think of that could possibly help you. I'm going to send it out in a link uh, this week. And so if you are not a subscriber to my Things for Thursday email, you can do that just simply by texting the word THINGS, T-H-I-N-G-S, to the number 66866. That's THINGS to 66866. And if you're listening to this and it's past the week I send it out, when you subscribe and you get your opening email from me, just send me a reply and I'll be sure to send you that link with all of those mega bundle of, of thank you gifts that I have for you. And now as we turn our attention to God's word today, I was really praying through, what do I want to communicate and, and I was thinking about some of the particular parenting struggles that, that I've had. And I've had quite a few. I've had to tell my three-year-old girl that her mommy is now in heaven. I've had to uh, walk through leukemia treatment with my five 
to six, seven-year-old son, uh, my wife and I did. I've wrestled through foster care and adoption. I don't think I've ever shared this on the podcast, but uh, our very first foster child, we actually had an abuse report, an abuse allegation called in about us over diaper rash. And, uh, you know, it's pretty violating and humiliating to have um, Child Protective Services show up at your house to interview you over diaper rash, which, by the way, the diaper rash wasn't even on us. It was on the mom visiting and uh, we are not abusive and have been completely cleared. But, you know, accusations when you're trying to do what's right can be pretty devastating and demoralizing. Additionally, just fostering and adoptive through special needs challenges. You know, these are the mega things. And and I got to be honest that there's something about the way that the Lord has wired me that if 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 things are a full-blown crisis... I'm pretty good at remembering to stick to the Lord. I'm pretty good at remembering that, hey, this is beyond me. I must cling to Jesus as I walk through this. And then I think of just kind of the regular daily stuff, just, you know, regular parenting challenges, regular spousal challenges and family challenges. And and these are the ones that really can demoralize me. Um, because I have it in my mind that I should be able to take care of this. I should be able to fix this, that this is this is in my power. And then because I think it's in my power, the more that I work towards it, the worse the outcome goes sometimes because, you know, my little tip or my little trick or my little uh, strategy and plan doesn't change the situation or the heart like I think it's going to. And I can just get really emotionally tanked. And so as I was thinking through those things, I think there's one commonality in, in all of those cases that if I were to communicate to you the most important thing that I can share with you, um, it would be this. Believe the gospel. Believe the gospel in its entirety. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you. And it's interesting. He says you receive the gospel, you stand in the gospel, and he says you are being saved by the gospel. It's an active, ongoing process. And then in verse 3, he says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day, and in accordance with the Scriptures. And, and he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, And then he appeared to more than 500 at one time, most of whom are alive still, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to the apostles. And last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me. And I just want us to think about this reality for a minute. Paul says that he wants to deliver of first importance this truth, that Jesus died for our sins and that he was raised from the dead. And then he gives literal names of people that Jesus appeared to, including himself. And, and I begin to think about how important this is, that uh, you know there are over 2 billion people in this world who would claim to be Christian at this time. And if you were to survey across those 2 billion, um, many of them would be cultural Christians, they would be Christian by birth or just by uh, affinity, And if you were to really start to ask a lot of them, many of them might not believe that Jesus actually even existed. And then some of those who believe he existed believed that he was a good teacher, a good moral man. Many of them would say, yeah, he, I don't really believe that he died and rose again. But when I go back to scripture and what Paul says is the whole thing that he is staking his life on, it's the fact, the reality not the inspirational allegory, but the reality that Jesus died for his sins and rose again to prove that he uh, actually paid the price for those sins. And as, as a mom, as a dad, as a husband or as a wife, I, I want to point us back to the reality that the most important thing in your life is not your bank account. It's not your service at church. It's not how good your kids are doing. 
uh, in any activity or even in your home today, the most important thing in your life is the reality that Jesus died for your sins and he rose again. Now, many of us believe that gospel. Uh, and if you don't believe that gospel, I, I want to encourage you that there is, there is no greater day than today for you to accept that reality, to put your faith and put your trust in Jesus. And many of us believe that reality, but, but if we're honest, it's like we believe that Jesus died for our sins and so that when we die, he's going to take us to heaven. So that's covered. But we forget to believe the gospel in the moment as it applies to our life. And so I just want to point out a few realities of believing the gospel in the day-to-day -day that should radically change your narrative as you walk through any event. And for that, I just kind of think of, of Romans chapter 8, which our church is walking through right now um, during our Sunday time together. Uh, number one, Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Hey, mom. Hey, dad. However crappy of a parent you were this week, there is no condemnation for you if you're in Christ Jesus. God is not sitting in heaven with a scorecard rating your righteousness based on how you did as a parent or how you did as a spouse. And you probably did blow it. You know, you might be conscious of how you blew it, and you might not even be conscious of how you blew it in other areas. And yet still, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So that, you know what? Think about the one of the failures that you are grieved the most about and ask yourself this question. How do I interpret this? How do I think about this in light of the fact that Jesus died and rose again? Yeah, I blew it. I failed. I sinned or I just wasn't enough. Now, how do I think about that in light of the fact that Jesus died and rose again? I'd like to take a minute to tell you about a ministry that has changed my life. Hope Givers is a mission that rescues orphaned and at-risk children in India. They gather the children in hope homes across the nation and feed, clothe, and educate them in the name of Jesus. Many of these children grow up to be pastors or missionaries to the most unreached cities and villages of India and South Asia. Others become doctors, teachers, or just moms and dads with stable jobs raising families, having escaped generations of abject poverty. Not only have I supported Hope Givers over the years, I've also visited Hope Homes, schools, and churches in India several times. I've even spent Christmas at a Hope Home in India with my family. Hope Givers is the real deal. If you're looking for a way to give to Jesus this holiday season, I want to encourage your family to purchase a Hope Chest as a Christmas gift for an orphan. You'll provide clothing, toiletries, a blanket, a sweater, school supplies, a toy, and a special Christmas meal for a child that Jesus loves and died for. Find out more at www.hopegivers.org. And as you move on in Romans chapter 8, one of the great realities that comes out is that not only is there no condemnation for us uh, who are in Christ Jesus, but God sends his Holy Spirit to dwell within us. And so one of the realities of the gospel, if I truly believe and put my trust in the fact that Jesus died and rose for my sins, the Holy Spirit dwells inside me. And I actually got to preach on this a few weeks ago. Um, we live in an area in South Florida where there is a, a nuclear power plant just right up the road from us. Um, and we also live in an area where we get hurricanes, and when we do, the power is knocked out sometimes. And so uh, people in our church are familiar with uh, generators and trying to run your house off of a generator. Now, if, if the power's out for a week or two weeks, it's great to have a generator. With the generator, you can keep your refrigerator going, you can uh, keep some lights going in the house, and you might be able to run a window unit air conditioner. But if you try to run your life off of a generator the whole house will crash. The generator will, will, will just shut down. You cannot do it. And in the same way, I think that's a good picture of trying to run your life off of your flesh and off of your own power. Like you might be able to do some things, but it's going to come crashing. Meanwhile, having the Holy Spirit inside you is, is the equivalent of that nuclear power plant that's right up the road. There is nothing that God would require in your life that he is not there and empowering you to do. 
Uh, one of my favorite verses in Romans chapter 8 is verse 11 that says, If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Isn't that amazing to think about that the, the very Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is the very spirit that is living in you and is available as the power source for whatever it is that you're going to do. Uh, so how do you connect to that power source? That's a great question. Like your kids are driving you nuts. Um, you're late with things. You, you have piles of stuff all over the floor. How do I connect with that power source? I, I think, you know, Romans 8 makes it much simpler than, than what we think. It just simply talks about this. If you set your mind on the flesh, you get death. And if you set your mind on the spirit, you get life. And so one of the practices that I have personally been working on over the last several weeks, because I've been heavy, I've been depressed, there's just been things beyond my control, is a constant reminder that God is with me, that Christ is in me, that, I mean, and, and literally the Holy Spirit is in me. I'm setting my mind on the presence of God. I'm practicing the presence of God. And then I'm just continuing to do whatever it is that I need to do in that. You know, I, I can think of, of things that have come up that are forgiveness issues where it's like, how could I forgive this and get over it? And then I remember, oh, well, the Holy Spirit is in me. I can access the power of God to forgive. And, and then I think of, of, of the reality of the gospel, of all of these parables that Jesus tells the parable of the unforgiving servant, how one who who had trillions of dollars in debt, like if you really do weigh out the amount of weight that talents of gold is, the one who had trillions of dollars in debt and was forgiven and then held his servant who owed him like 30 days wages or six months wages, um, and, and he held that against them. And then I remember that I have been forgiven of everything. How could I possibly hold on to this hurt and hold it against somebody. I have been freely forgiven. And now because Christ is in me, I can freely forgive. You know, the, the way that I live the gospel is not waiting for their apology and for them to make things right. The way that I live the gospel is to remember the crushing debt that I had that I've been forgiven of. That's a great reality of it. Another reality of believing the gospel is believing that even if I can't figure out how to pray it right, uh, in Romans 8, it says, we don't know how to pray as we ought to, but the Holy Spirit intercedes with us with groanings too deep for words. Isn't that amazing that God prays to God for you with groanings? I, you ever been through something where you're groaning, where you're longing? Well, the Holy Spirit groans on our behalf, just like creation groans for the revealing of God, the Holy Spirit groans with longing and, and, and writing our prayers. And I don't know exactly how it works, but man, am I so thankful that not only am I not alone, but that God himself is interceding on my behalf. And then, you know, one of the greatest verses in the whole Bible, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, you can believe the gospel that whatever is happening in your life, it may not be good, it certainly may not be something that God caused because God does not cause sin. But you can be confident that if you love God, if you belong to Jesus, that all of those things will work together for your good. Now, you may not see the good right now. Some of it you may not see on this earth. It may be e eternal. But hey, good news. This life is a blip. So if you don't see the good on this life, uh, but you do get to see it eternally, man, what a, what a reward. The next verse, though, I think is is one of the keys to that for verse 29, Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And, and I think about what is God working for good and what does good look like to God? And I think the answer is right there in verse 29. Good to God in your life is is for you to be conformed to the image of Jesus. It's for you to be more like Jesus. And what I can be confident in is that the trials that I'm going through, the tragedies that I'm going through, the betrayal that I experienced, the failure that I experienced, and yeah, the blessings and the good things and the joys and the special moments, God is working all of that together 
to make me more like Jesus. And friend, God is working all of your trials together and all of your victories together to make you more like Jesus. Have you ever thought about, man, it'd be so much easier to get through this thing if I was more like Jesus? Well, that's exactly what God's doing. You're not there yet, but man, aren't you better than what you were? Aren't you more like Jesus than what you were? Isn't it incredible when you start believing the gospel, how it changes the very mundane or sad or tragic or hurtful in your life? Won't you be able to forgive better when you're more like Jesus? Well, that's what God's working in you. Some of those things stink, though. Some of those things are tragic and they're hard. You know, and then finally, the belief of the gospel that I, I think about is, is towards the end of Romans 8, um, when Paul says, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? So God is not against me in my marriage. God is not against me uh, in my parenting. God may absolutely be against my actions if I'm rebellious or just being very foolish. God will be against my actions because he's a loving father, but he's not against me. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he not also give graciously to us all things? And then you think of, of the end of Romans 8. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friend, when you believe the gospel, it changes how you parent. It changes how you walk your marriage. It changes how you handle your singleness. It changes how you handle your loneliness because you believe that you are not alone and that you are not separated from the love of God. I want to thank you so much for however many of the 200 episodes of Less Parent on Purpose that you have been around for. I hope we get another thousand. Um, actually, I hope Jesus comes back tomorrow and this is the last episode. But if he doesn't, I hope we get a long time together. And I hope as we do that you and I can believe the gospel more and more every single day. And as we believe it, it makes it easier for our spouses to believe it. It makes it easier for our children to believe it and our family to believe it. And even those who don't know God whatsoever, the way that we believe the gospel will help them believe it too. Let me just close out today with a, a word of prayer for you. Lord, I thank you for the time that we've got to spend today. I thank you for the encouragement of your word. And God, I pray for my friend that's listening that you would empower them through your Holy Spirit to believe the gospel. For whatever situation they're walking through right now, for whatever trial they're walking through right now, Lord, help them to believe the gospel, that Jesus died and rose again to not only pay the price for their sin, but to give them life and to enable them to live life. Lord, I pray that you would uh, comfort their worries and their hurts, that you would calm their fears. Lord, I pray that the peace of Christ, which passes all understanding, would guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. God, I pray that you would help to make us better moms, better dads, better husbands, better wives, even better kids to our parents, and help us to be children of God that honor you and bring joy to your heart. Thank you for this time. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you're still listening all the way to the credits, then I hope that that means that this was a particular blessing to you to hear this podcast. If so, I want to encourage you to share it with somebody else that you think might be helped by it. You're welcome to go to lessparentonpurpose.com to find out more information about show notes, about past issues, all kinds of things to help your family. And I do want to say that Less Parent on Purpose is a user-supported podcast. And if you would like to be a part of that, 
you can go to letsparanormalpurpose.com, learn how to be a supporter through Patreon or through a one-time gift. Thank you so much for listening. Again, share this with somebody that you know needs to hear it. Remember that parenting is a marathon, not a sprint. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you.